Welcome to this venue. I believe we're the first group to have booked this venue, and it looks rather good. We'll find out. My name is Ross Harvey. I'm a member of the White Committee, and you'll hear a little more about that soon. Uh, welcome to the 2018 White Lecture, this, the tenth in an annual series. Um, the White Lecture, and I read from the, the website for it, aims to provide thought, leadership, and inspiration in the librarianship, archives, and records sector by inviting a distinguished speaker. Um, the White Lecture is one of the activities funded by a bequest made by Jean and Billy or Phyllis White, and you will hear more about them soon. <coughs> now, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor John Whittle, Chair of the White Committee and Dean of the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. John. Thank you, Ross. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd first of all just like to um, start by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we are gathered here today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, so as Ross said, um, I am fortunate enough to be the Dean of the Faculty of Information of Technology at Monash University. And so you know, it's a, I'd really like to kind of extend a warm welcome to everyone this evening on behalf of Monash University and the Faculty of IT. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to run this event annually, and it's a real, um, you know, exciting time to have so many people in the room tonight. Um, as Ross said, this um, lecture is associated with the White Fund, which celebrates the legacy of the late Jean White and her sister Phyllis. Um, now, Jean was foundation professor of librarianship in the Graduate School of Librarianship um, at Monash in 1975 and retired in 1988. And she left a sizable bequest um, from her estate to support research in librarianship records and archives. And the, that white fund through our committee funds a number of initiatives, including supporting PhD students, research projects, and travel for researchers. Now, I just want to say a few words about the Faculty of IT and how um, librarianship archives and record keeping fits into IT, because you might be wondering why is a Faculty of IT whose um, kind of core business is computing and computer science interested in such topics? Um, and really, the faculty of IT is a, it's the th thing to understand about it is it's a very, very broad faculty in its remit. Um, so we, we have about 160 academic staff in our faculty. It's the only faculty, the only dedicated faculty of IT in Australia. It's one of the largest in the world. And we've got researchers working on everything from very, very hardcore computer science to things that are much more at the kind of social and organizational end of IT which is uh, where some of the archives and record keeping work fits in. And in fact, we've got you know, a, a really world leading group in archives and record keeping um, uh, research, I would say. And just to give you a flavor of the kind of stuff that they do, so we've got um, some, you know, some pretty amazing projects within the faculty in, in that kind of archives and record keeping space. So one of our researchers, uh, Joanne Evans, who holds an ARC Future Fellowship, she is running a project called The Rights of the Child, which is really looking at the technology needs and access to records and digital records of children who are in care or transitioning out of care. And that culminated in a very, very large national summit last year that was very, very well attended from um, various stakeholders all over Australia and is having a real positive social impact um, on, on people's lives. We've got other projects that are using real cutting edge computer science technologies, things like virtual reality, augmented reality, and 3D animation, looking to try and keep alive records of how different tribes of the first Australians lived and worked. And if you're ever over at our Caulfield campus, I encourage you to take a visit to our Sensi Lab where you'll see some of that work displayed. One of the points that I'd like to make about tonight, um, or, or, or this area, is that um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of additional changes in the areas of libraries, archives, and records over the years to come. 
Um, you know, if you look at how technology is transforming the world with things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, Internet of Things, and so forth, just about every industry is being revolutionized by technology. Um, and that includes, you know, the, the science and engineering fields, but also the humanities and social science fields. If you look at how AI, for example, is revolutionizing law, finance, medicine, and so forth, you know, big things are happening right now. And I think libraries are going to be no different to that, so it's, you know, I'm really looking forward to Stuart's talk tonight. Um, but I think, I think we've got to accept, therefore, that it's both an exciting time for libraries and, and how they can best harness that new technology, um, but it's also a, a time of significant change for libraries as well. And I'll just share a few stories from my own experience um, with how those libraries have changed over the years from what I've seen. So before I moved to Melbourne about 15 um, months ago, I lived in a small town called Lancaster in the northwest of England that had a very old Victorian library in the Market Square. It, 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 it had traditionally been a, a community hub, um, but was facing tough times because the community was perhaps not engaging as much with the library as it could. Um, there were cuts from the local council, meaning that they couldn't staff it in the same way. And it could easily have gone out of business, as many libraries around the UK have done in recent years. But the, the, some of the real kind of pioneering staff got together and decided to do something about that. And they really took a leading role in reinventing what it means to be a library. Um, and took the view that libraries are not just about access to books and other artifacts, but they can be real community spaces. They, they actually got a grant to completely refurbish the inside of the library and, and make it into a space that was reconfigurable so they could hold events. They started running a very successful uh, series of events um, for teenagers to get teenagers into the library called Get It Loud in Libraries, which was um, essentially turning the library into a concert venue, and they got some very, very high-profile um, musicians to come and play, actually. And then the next step for that was to, uh, to, to, to bring comedy into the mix, and they, they started a new series of events called Laugh Out Loud in Libraries, um, and I think this is a really good example of, of using the space, using the library to, to engage with the community and to get the community in who would then spend more time with the collection that they have. And then one um, event that I was involved in um, was an initiative called the, the Living Library, which some people in this room might be aware of, but this is a global phenomenon that's trying to think about, you know, um, let's not just go and read about other people's lives, but let's actually go and meet those people who are leading, leading those other lives. And so the idea is that on a Saturday morning, you could sign up to go and have a coffee with somebody who came from a completely different walk of life than you, and you just sit down in the library and you talk with them and you experience this living library. And, and that, that's a global phenomenon that's been very successful and, and certainly is a good example of how libraries are changing. But back to technology, I think that t technology is really changing libraries as well, and I do see that as an opportunity rather than a threat. I did some work with the British Library um, a few years ago. We had a, um, a project trying to help them to open up their collection to a, a broader audience, because of course British Library has um, a very, very large collection, much of which is never really seen. Um, we did some work around um, visualizations on the library walls so that people could get a better insight to what was actually in the library. But we also had a project around trying to uh, create digital serendipity. Um, so this was based on the idea that, um, you know, in, in the good old days when you, you, when you walked down a, a stack of bookshelves looking for a particular book, you might suddenly see a book out of the corner of your eye that looked quite nice and so you pick that book up instead and you open it up and it turns out that you had a serendipitous encounter. You, you, you learn something that you weren't looking for. And there, there's an argument that in today's digital world with social media and AI recommender systems that give you information based on your past searches and so forth, that that serendipity has been lost. 
And so what we did was we used the um, information about where library goers, had, what they'd been searching for, what they were talking about on social media, to suggest things to them in the digital world that they might want to take a look at, but that didn't just match closely their interests, but was far enough away from their interests that it could provide that sense of serendipity, and that was actually um, displayed in an exhibition in, in the British Library. So I'm really excited um, to see what changes are afoot um, at the intersection between computing and IT and libraries, archives, and record keeping. I think it's actually a very exciting time. Um, I'd like to see Monash and the faculty of IT really being at the forefront of that, that transformation, that revolution, and I believe that we've got the people within the faculty to really take a leading role in that. Um, and I'm particularly excited to, to hear from, uh, from Stuart this evening, who's written so extensively about um, the history of libraries. And I will now pass you over to Brian, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. It's, it's obvious that we didn't get together to decide who was going to say what, but uh, I, I have a printed text which I will uh, pursue. Uh, so those of you who are regulars at these uh, lectures, uh, and this, as you've heard, is the 10th, will be familiar with their history, uh, but... Um, do you want me to go back to the beginning? Uh, uh, what, what I will do is provide a, a bit of, uh, of the background. So the, the name White, as you've heard, refers to uh, the sisters, Jean Primrose White and Phyllis Primrose White. Uh, they were both born and schooled in Adelaide, though home was a sheep station somewhere beyond Port Augusta, where their father, Edward Primrose White, was manager. Uh, their mother died uh, while Jean was a toddler and Phyllis a baby, and they were brought up by their aunt, uh, their mother's sister, who eventually became the second Mrs. White. Uh, I've said that uh, White refers to two sisters, though the Monash connection is confined to Jean. Uh, Phyllis, or Billy as you've already heard, as she was usually known, led what appears to have been an unremarkable life as a respected secondary school teacher of English in Adelaide. I can say little more about her simply on the grounds that she left a very small footprint. The same could not be said of Jean, whose footprint was large, uh, size 43 actually. <laughs> At the time of her retirement in 1988, having reached the critical age of 65, she had long been a dominant figure in the profession of librarianship in Australia and recognized overseas as well. Uh, this was a profession into which she'd fallen by accident. Uh, having fallen, she soon, however, caught what she herself called the library bug. Uh, this was the early years of the Second World War uh, and needing to support herself as a student at the University of Adelaide, uh, she found herself a job at the public, now State Library of South Australia, uh, simply because it was next door on North Terrace. Uh, she was fortunate in the timing in that a number of the male staff were away on active service. Uh, and so there were openings that she was able to uh, take advantage of which would otherwise have been denied her. Uh, among her duties was conducting classes in practically every subject, I must say, uh, for the Institute's ex external exams. And this set her on the path which led eventually to the foundation professorship at the Graduate School of Librarianship at Monash in 1975. Uh, after long stints on the Board of Education and as editor of the Australian Library Journal and professional positions in the Library of Sydney University, and in the National Library of Australia. Uh, Jean's initial degree was a BA 
with first-class honors in English literature. That's Adelaide. She had a remarkable memory for literature in English, particularly poetry, fostered by her father, who apparently had an extensive collection of Inglit. So reading was no doubt about the only thing you could do as a source of relaxation on a station so far from uh, anywhere. Uh, Jean died in 2003, Phyllis in 2005. Uh, neither sister married and they had no close relatives. After specific charitable and personal bequests, Jean left the residue of her estate to Monash University. And I'll uh, jump now. Uh, in the course of her career, Jean developed a particular interest in the history of libraries and of education for librarianship. But against this interest should be said her interest in the future. One of the first courses that she established in the Master of Librarianship program in 1976 was the future of library and information services, uh, usually referred to as Follies. Uh, this point about uh, history and future uh, brings me to this evening's lecturer, Dr. Stuart Kells. Uh, and as some of you will appreciate, obviously born to be a bookman, with, with whom Jean, Jean would have found much in common, literature, history, particularly of libraries, and the future. Uh, Stuart has many strings to his bow. Uh, most recently having been appointed an adjunct professor at La Trobe University's College of Arts, Social Sciences and Commerce. Uh, he is a BCom, MCom graduate, both with first class honours from the University of Melbourne and has a PhD in law from Monash University. So given this background, it's not surprising that he's been an economic advisor to Victorian premiers and assistant auditor general in Victoria. But it's that combination of history, literature, and libraries, and antiquarian bookselling that has made him a perfect fit as a white lecturer. He's the author of at least five books, uh, four, of, four of them illustrating his bookish and librarianly interest. Uh, three of them are of uh, particular interest. The uh, history of the, of the Lane brothers and the penguin phenomenon. Uh, in some ways, this is a whodunit. Uh, and it's not Alan who got the kudos, but Richard who is the uh, hero. Uh, and there is a strong uh, Australian component which is worth uh, pursuing. Uh, on the history of libraries, in fact as well as fiction, And most recently, uh, <coughs> Shakespeare's Library, which I think is a bit misleading as a title, but uh, it takes as its starting point how little we know about Shakespeare and his books, uh, and revealing how those gaps in the story have been filled with various characters, many of them nefarious. Uh, and with that, it gives me considerable pleasure to invite Dr. Kells as the 10th white lecturer to speak on libraries, past, present, and future. Dr. Kells. How's it sound microphone-wise? Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Brian. Very pleased to be here with you today. Uh, we're the first people to use this room, I think, uh, as Ross said, um, in one of the most handsome and visited libraries in the world. So a perfect place to be giving the, the 2018 Jean White Lecture. And I'm honoured to help celebrate Jean White's legacy and to join the ranks of previous Jean White lecturers such as Professor Lynette Russell of Monash University's Indigenous Studies Centre, Dr Alex Byrne, former New South Wales State Librarian, and Giles Mandelbrot, 
librarian and archivist at Lambeth Palace Library in London. I had the pleasure of meeting Giles at his library last year, and he gave me a generous tour of the collection that is to Anglicanism what the Vatican Library is to Catholicism. That visit was part of my bibliothecal world tour, a journey that informed my 2017 book, The Library, A Catalogue of Wonders, in which I wrote about bookworms and microbats and bibliomaniacs, and I probed the storied history of ancient libraries, like the Great Library of Alexandria, in which doctors and astronomers and mathematicians made great discoveries. Eratosthenes worked out 99% of the circumference of the Earth, and Archimedes worked out 99.9% .9 of pi. I also studied an ancient library much closer to home, the oral library of the Aranta people of Central Australia. That library is incredibly rich and has a fraught recent history. It was a pleasure for me to acknowledge the Aranta people's prominent place in the wider tradition of world libraries. I also studied early modern collections and ultra-modern ones, like the Benecki one behind us, and postmodern ones. And I'm grateful for the librarians here and around the world who've embraced the book and its author. For my talk today, I will again adopt a broad definition of libraries and also of librarians, a term I use to describe people who have library skills but not necessarily a library degree. In the classical world, libraries and librarians enjoyed high status, as they did in the medieval Islamic world and the medieval Buddhist world. In Europe's dark ages, there was a great forgetting of the value of libraries, and the Renaissance was in large part founded upon the rediscovery of that value. Today, thanks in part to that rediscovery, there are more than two million public and school libraries around the world. Many of those libraries are under threat from war, such as in Syria and Iraq, and from austerity, so-called austerity, and underfunding, such as in the UK, where, as, um, as you've already heard, where hundreds of local libraries have recently been closed. The much heralded death of the book is just another in the list of threats. But for the most part, books have bounced back, and so have libraries. In fact, around the world, I think it's safe to say that libraries today are as strong as they've been at any time in the last 2,000 years. In Australia, public libraries are particularly well catered for. Victoria's municipal libraries are going from strength to strength, as is this, the State Library. In New South Wales, municipal libraries have recently received $60 million of investment from the state's library minister. In the, in the UK, the library cuts have not been reversed, but they have become a national disgrace, a lightning rod for disaffection with the government and the focus of a spirited defence by authors and scholars and other library users from all walks of life. So from this, I think we can safely conclude that we have not entered another library dark age. We do, however, need to stay vigilant. As public institutions, libraries don't fit a narrow idea of a business case or an investment logic or a theory of change. People have tried to evaluate libraries using techniques like revealed preference and willingness to pay and hedonic pricing and other techniques, and you've all seen them before, but these methods can only ever tell part of the story. Libraries generate a wide set of benefits, some of which are intangible and complex. We don't need to apologise about investing in libraries in the absence of a clear and narrow set of quantifiable benefits. 
What we do need to do is stick together and keep telling the stories about the impact of libraries on people starting businesses, on people learning languages, on young people and middle-aged people and older people, on migrants and upskillers, on scholars and creatives, on the homeless and the dispossessed. Libraries do indeed change lives. We need to tell the stories of how libraries can open up a literate life and even a literary one, how they increase social engagement and social connection and how they intertwine with notions of place and of the viability of cities and communities. In that context, today, libraries have a powerful constituency and Twitter provides a case in point. The talk just took a left turn that you didn't expect. Anyone who knows Twitter knows the, the various different Twitter subcultures. And a few of my Twitter's, Twitter friends are here tonight. The only reason I said yes to this was so I could meet some of my Twitter buddies. But anyway, there are, there are various different Twitter subcultures. There's about four, four people who know that in here. Um, there's the bizarre and troubling world of Trump Twitter. There are the enthralling worlds of gardening Twitter and hot rod Twitter and dogs feeding rabbits Twitter. And I spent some time today in dogs feeding rabbits Twitter. Then there's my favorite, rare books Twitter. And I'm writing a novel Twitter. And another favorite, library Twitter. The power of library Twitter was recently demonstrated in a spectacular way. Two months ago, and we kind of feel sorry for the guy now, a Forbes magazine contributor wrote that Amazon bookshops should replace public libraries. The principal rationale was to save money. The article was peppered with silly errors, including a misunderstanding of how libraries are funded and a misstatement of the nature of a third space. More fundamentally, the article missed the complex value of libraries and how people appreciate and depend on that value. The response of those people was swift. In the space of two hours, tens of thousands of tweeters pointed out their errors and took issue with the contributor's thesis. Almost as swiftly, Forbes took the article down and issued a contrite and awkward explanation that the article was outside the contributor's area of expertise. The Twitter conversation continued and the judgment was rightly harsh. It revealed an unexpected harmony between analog and digital and it demonstrated a new library evaluation methodology, one that might be termed crowd love. And I mean this in the sense of crowdfunding and crowd wisdom, not in some sort of sense of a 70s love-in. Crowd love is a mass articulation of affection, in this case, for libraries. And the message from the Forbes affair is simple. Don't mess with our libraries and don't mess with our librarians. In 2018, we've reached a point at which, without hubris and without complacency, we can begin to dare to imagine an ambitious future for libraries. Our librarians and our libraries are empowered. What should we do with this new power? There are several spheres of potential ambition, including the nature of public libraries' institutional roles, their relationship with the education system, and their importance as social organisations. I've already mentioned the so-called death of the book. Over the past decade, librarians and their friends have grappled with the fear that books and libraries were ready to be superseded. Though understandable, those fears were, for the most part, misplaced. But at the same time, other types of institutions and organisations have grappled with real obsolescence. Those entities, in fields such as higher education, journalism, 
business services and public integrity have been technologically disrupted in ways that libraries have not. Libraries can help fill the gaps left by these obsolete institutions and libraries can teach others about how to survive and thrive in the era of digital disruption. Libraries can also collaborate with other public agencies and institutions, including with public integrity bodies and citizen auditors, and in the fields of vocational and higher education, where libraries are able to anchor and enrich the learning journey. And with that in mind, let's pause for a quick thought experiment. Imagine a merger between a library and a university, like a major library like this one and a university like the one next door. In picturing that merger, our minds naturally turn to the idea of the library becoming some kind of augmentation or adjunct of the university. But what about a different kind of merger in which the library was on top? The result would not be a university library, but a library university. That sounds a bit unnatural to our ears, but it's not too far away from the libraries of the classical world, such as the one that Eratosthenes and Archimedes used. Collaborating with social organisations is another important frontier for libraries. Last week, at the next library conference in Berlin, David Lanks delivered a manifesto for global librarianship. He argued that libraries must play a crucial local role, not as neutral providers of access, but as advocates for the towns, universities and communities that they serve. This picture sees libraries playing a much larger role in social outreach and in addressing localised disadvantage. It sees the library as an instrument of social change. In another important sense also, libraries can play a more active social role. During my world tour, I noticed the incursion of pulp novels and a pulp sensibility into libraries and particularly into rare book collections. And you can see it if you go over near the mirror of the world, for example. I've written about that incursion in the context of breaking down traditional ideas of what constitutes literature and what constitutes a meritorious book and the traditional oppositions of high and low. Crime pulps and sci-fi paperbacks and comics are now prized by such respectable institutions as the Smithsonian and the Houghton and the British Library and our very own SLV. This incursion is changing libraries and librarianship. But an another trend is even more radical. In the Trump era, libraries in the US and around the world are foregrounding the material evidence of activism and protest. Library exhibitions and publications have embraced the writings and the artefacts of social reformers and counterculture movements, celebrating the fights for women's rights and civil rights and LGBTIQ rights. In this regard, libraries are playing an essential social and political role. Amidst today's conspiracy theories and fake news, Libraries and archives and records are a priceless way to tell the truth about the present and the past and to teach people how to, how to distinguish between truth and lies. The need to tell the truth is urgent in ways that we might never have foreseen even a few years ago. Today, we need books and manuscripts and artefacts to speak with sober authority and we may, seen, may soon need to use networks of libraries to act like analogue blockchains of truth, making it more difficult to purge people and ideas and crimes from the historical record. 
That sounds a bit abstract here, but it doesn't sound abstract at all in America. Activism within libraries is typically grouped with the political left, but there is something inherently conservative about conservation. Some right-wing politicians get cross when libraries and archives play an activist role. My response to them is pretty straightforward. If those politicians stopped doing mean-spirited and ill-conceived things like Brexit and Trump, and if they stopped lying about the past and the climate, then libraries' truth-telling role would be less confronting. That role is crucial in helping us to come to terms with our own history and to open the way to the future. In Japan, where I've just come back from, the country's foundational documents speak with stunning honesty about the crimes and disasters of the past. In Australia, libraries and archives can play an equally powerful role in Indigenous reconciliation and acknowledgement and in reaching a more just compact with the first Australians. The future of libraries is bright, but not without risks. All of us should be wary of creeping austerity and creeping volunteerism. The trend of library philanthropy also brings dangers. Philanthropy can be a boon, but only if libraries have adequate base funding and only if the philanthropists are closely aligned with the library's mission. I want to conclude my lecture by sketching a vision of the future of libraries. A vision in which no one would think of replacing professional librarians with volunteers. A vision in which libraries have the upper hand with universities not the other way around. A vision in which the value of rare books is not vastly below the price of contemporary art. And one in which we don't need to keep making the argument about the value of libraries. And in which libraries are central to our efforts to build a fair and just society on a frank reckoning with our past and a future in which our crowd love of libraries is unnecessary to express, but is expressed anyway and often. Thank you. I don't know what happens next. I think we do Q&A. Brilliant. So um, Sal has got the roving mic and we're in your hands. Does anyone know the movie Gattaca? Yeah. Don't plan for the return journey. I always do talks like that, like I do the talk and I never actually think about the Q&A. So this is, this is the return journey, so we'll see how we go. I've just had enough wine to, to have the courage to ask this. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know where I could get some old, real catalogue drawers for catalogue cards? <laughs> I'm, I've, I'm keeping a library with ordinary catalogue cards and I'm cataloguing these books and putting it all on cards and I haven't got enough space, I haven't got enough drawers. Does anyone know where I could get some some second-hand catalogue drawers. <laughs> Throw, throwaways. Hmm? I've looked on Gumtree and I couldn't find any. So I, I, I can answer that. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's a shop called The Junk, Junk Company on Elizabeth Street, which has them. But also Justine Hyde, who's the director here, is, is awesome. And Justine knows where everything is. And there is actually a room deep dark underneath the SLV, which has, like, Indiana Jones style, every kind of catalogue cupboard you can imagine. So have a chat with Justine. <laughs> I'm sure they could clear some of them out. I've uh, got one down the back there. Thank you.
Um, I, I 100% agree with the sentiments that you've spoken tonight. Thank you very much for reinforcing them. And I think the um, crowd love <laughs> is a fantastic concept. Um, I'm really interested in an educational point of view from what you were saying with the library university as opposed to the university library mm -hmm. when we've got the government bodies such as, say, TEXA, which uh, accredits all our universities, which is actually continuously and purposefully moving towards the relaxation of the requirements that universities are supposed to have for libraries. How do we reverse that? What's, what's, how do we mm. turn this crowd love into something that politicians are actually going to look, listen to? Good question. So th there's been a real downgrading of the status of university libraries, both in terms of funding but also administratively. So it used to be the, the case that the university library was, university librarian was very senior, uh, not so uh, these days. There's obviously people who can speak more to that than I can. But th the short answer is you need to make noise about it and, and it needs to be a campaign in the same way that, that um, librarians are activated for other causes. That needs to be something we should talk to universities about. I don't know whether the Dean wants to say something about that. I, I have this wonderful sort of no care or, or care, no responsibility relationship with my university, but um, not everyone has that relationship. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Karen Seaman. I'm from Bayside Library Service here in Melbourne and I think you've been at our library recently. Um, but I just wanted to mention you did use the, the term libraries change lives before and I just wanted to say that mm. yesterday morning was the launch of a major advocacy campaign for Victorian public libraries called Libraries Change Lives. So hashtag that as much as you can. So thank yes, you. Yes, I had a hashtag, but I didn't actually voice the hashtag. Yeah, I thought, I thought that. I thought I've that, asked yeah, someone to live to tweet it. this as we've been going, but I'm not sure that the live tweeting is happening. So I couldn't hear any buttons, <laughs> but I'll do, I promise I'll tweet afterward. All right, thank you. It's funny, half the audience are tweeters and the other half don't really know what Twitter is. Oh, hi, hi, my name is Leonie Burke. And I'm interested in your comment about the creeping volunteerism. Mm. I've been working with a small historical library, which is a su subscription library, very low rate of subscription for the users, which makes it affordable for them. Um, and they have a very small core staff and a vast army of volunteers who <laughs> do heaps of work around the place. How, how do you um, imagine that that library might get away from that paradigm? Sure. I mean, volunteers do lots of things and they're essential. But what I'm really talking about is um, when you have uh, core library staff being replaced by volunteers who are basically having the same skill set and doing the same kind of job, that's not really volunteerism. That's just stopping paying people. Um, so there's that problem. And then there's another problem, which is that um, free resources often aren't free. They seem free, on paper they're free, but actually they require supervision and management and housing. Um, so a lot of free resources that appear in the not-for-profit sector actually bring with them a cost, and it's a cost in management time, and it's all sorts of other costs as well. So um, let's just not think that you can replace uh, trained uh, mainstream library resources with volunteers. I think that's a mistake, but also let's not uh, assume that philanthropy and volunteers are costless. Um, if you're lucky to get someone who volunteers and who is trained and who doesn't need much supervision, that's fantastic, but essentially that's just taking away a, a, an employee. Um, and if you get philanthropic money that diverts you in a direction that you weren't heading, uh, even if it's free money, it doesn't really actually take away the burden of, of what, um, what the library is trying to do. So. Um, you know, all of this is at the margin. I'm not in any way anti-volunteer, and I volunteer myself in all sorts of different ways, but uh, I'm realistic in saying that uh, in a public institution that has a core mission, um, you cannot fulfil that with, with free resources, fundamentally. OK, um, Ross Harvey from Monash. I was struck by the lack of mention of the word digital in your talk. I wonder if you would comment on that. Sure. 
Well, partly because I've written extensively about digital and analog in the past. I did touch on it in the context of, of Twitter. Um, we're talking more about libraries rather than books. In the world of books, the digital analog thing's a bit hotter than it is in the world of, of libraries. I think libraries are straddling digital and analog quite well. Um, what, what I said is what I believe, which is that the death of the book was exaggerated. Uh, books aren't dead. Physical books aren't dead. Uh, people are still buying books. Children are still reading um, physical books. Um, and the way we engage with physical books is changing in interesting ways. Um, millennials might read online and then buy a physical copy of the books they like. There's those sorts of things happening. Um, but there is, there is a culture of people building uh, private libraries as well. Uh, that's very strong overseas and it's probably building here. And people are still in love with the physicality of the book as well as the, the online version. I, I read in every possible mode. Uh, a lot of things I only read digitally. Um, and we touched on it a little bit before about the digitization of archival resources and the digitization of rare books has been an incredible boon for people like me. Um, I physically travel to libraries, but more often I digitally travel to libraries. But um, yeah, I, 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 I think we've reached a reasonable equilibrium both in the book market and in, in the world of libraries. I was very delighted by a lot of things that you said, but one area puzzled me, mm -hmm. the balance between libraries and universities. I was <laughs> at the National Library recently and talking to one of the directors about the collection development, where he said that the policy was much more slowly changing than in universities, where mm. it tends to be driven by the academics who happen to be there at that particular time. Could you say something about collection development in your library university? Well, um, my, my engagement with collection development is a very practical one. Like, I help people rescue books that are going to get thrown out, essentially, including academic books. Um, I've, I'm working with uh, a couple of very senior academic economists at the moment who are eminent people. Uh, who have first-class collections that tell a story about Australian scholarship. And it's not the easiest thing to find libraries that will take uh, big collections. Um, I've been quite lucky with places like Federation Uni at uh, Ballarat that's taken whole rooms of, of books. And that's unusual, but it's really changed the dynamic of what that university is about. And I, mean, I, I will go there and do scholarship. I'm now a fellow at the... Uh, whatever it is, the um, Collaborative Research Centre in Australian History, and I will do research in that library with physical books because those books are now there. Um, so I, I see it from a more from the rare book trade than from the, um, and obviously I'm doing that on a pro bono basis, but, but I see it more from the rare book trade than from any kind of um, collection development science. But there's people here who can talk to that. I'm sorry, I, it, it's, it's sort of outside my field. Is that all right? No more questions? I'm off the hook? Didn't plan for the return journey, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the um, Jean White Committee and on behalf of Monash for an absolutely fascinating lecture. I love that phrase of yours, the um, analog blockchain of truth, which is going to stick with me. That's going on Twitter. Yeah. Yes, and um, I think it's been a real privilege to be here and be part of this crowd love for libraries. So please, <laughs> once again, let's thank Stuart.